Hello, today is February 24th, 2009, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today James V. Arena. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for coming. Nice to be here. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Natick, Massachusetts. What year? 1930. And you currently live in Natick? Yes. Have you lived here most of your life? All my life, yeah. Tell us what Natick was like back then when you were growing up. Well, Natick hasn't changed that much, really. Uh, at least my neighborhood hasn't changed too much. Uh, we call it Squash Inn, as you probably know. And, uh, there's more traffic, of course, and uh, and I go downtown sometimes. I can remember the the traffic downtown was minimal, you know. So uh, traffic. It's the only thing I can see the difference is other than Route Nine, of course. Uh, this downtown I think is pretty well the same, really. And you graduated from Natick High School. Yes. What year did 1949. you? Nineteen forty-nine. And your marital status? Married. And you have children? Yes. How many? Six how children. And how many grandchildren? Five. When and where did you enter the military? What year? 1950. Um, we were t I was talking to a friend of mine the day before. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. Is this, and, uh, he, he says, well, let's join the Navy. And this was a, a Jimmy Connolly was his name. In fact, he was the father of our present selectman. And uh, at that time, you could take a bus right here at the Natick Common and go right to Boston. It was called the Boston Worcester. And uh, I says, okay, let's join the Navy. And uh, we'll meet the next morning. So the next morning came, Jimmy didn't show up. <laughs> so I went in to Boston, and that's where I joined. And you joined the Navy? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, when I got in there, we had planned to join the Navy, but when I got in there, and the hallway full of guys, and uh, of course the Marines were, the Navy were all together, and this Marine combined with the dress blues, and, and he says, uh, where are you going in the Navy? I goes, yeah. I said, what do you want to go there for? So he's going to join the Marines. So I, I said, oh, what the hell, I went in by myself, because Jimmy didn't show up, by the way. And uh, sure enough, I ended up with, in the Marines, and uh, no regrets. <laughs> so you joined the Marines by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what was going on in 1950 when you joined? Well, there was no war, for one thing. Mm -hmm. It was peacetime. And I had graduated from high school that previous June, and I tried furthering my education, but I quit. And I just didn't know what to do with myself. And it was quiet. I mean, it was my, I figured, you know, if I do join the service, it would give me time to think about what to do. And having joined the Marines without your friend, did yeah. other friends of yours join the service at that time? No. no. So you joined and you were in for how many years? Four years. Once you joined, and did you say that was June of uh, I joined in March. March. March of 1950, you joined out of Boston. Mm -hmm. When you, did you have to come home and tell your parents what oh, you yes. did? Oh yes. How did they feel about it? Uh, my mother was reluctant because uh, during World War II, I was home as a teenager and I had five brothers in the military, and all were in the combat zone. And I saw her during those years, and uh, it was difficult. I was for reluctant her. to tell her, but mm -hmm. you know. She went along with it. But my sister, I says, she says, what are you joining the Marines for? And I says, I don't know. I just joined. She says, you know, I said, there's no war. And she says, I'll bet there'll be a war. This is my sister, Tina. And sure enough, <laughs> there was a war. Shortly yeah, thereafter. Shortly after, when I was home, yeah. So once you told your parents and you, you signed up in March, where did, when and where did you go for your basic training uh, or boot camp? Paris Island, South Carolina. Was that your first time out of New England? Yes. Yeah. 
What was that like for you? Uh, it was exciting, really. Because I have three of us I ever got, I think, uh, I don't even think I ever left the state of Massachusetts. Or maybe I got to New Hampshire in high school with a friend. It's, yeah. it's about the furthest I've gone. And so, how long were you there in basic training? Well, at that time, it was peacetime, and boot camp was normally 10 weeks, but where they had plenty of time to fool with us, it was about three months. I got, yeah, about three months. What do you remember most about it? Well, it was hectic and humbling, uh, <laughs> but it was a challenge also. And I was in pretty good shape at that time. It was too far, I wasn't that far out of high school and I was still in pretty good shape. So uh, it, was, it was good, but I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it for a vacation. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic training? Uh, oh yes, oh yes. My training was kind of in reverse. Uh, when I got out of basic training, I went right down to uh, Camp Lejeune, and I was supposed to be in the Second Marine Division at that time and do some training, but at that time, uh, the military was under strength, and they needed everybody they could get to go to Korea. So and is that the, the war had broken out while I was home in boot camp leave. Okay. So when I went down, they needed all the bodies they could get. And was it, was it lessened the numbers because people had just come home from World War II, so numbers were down? Oh, very down. Is that why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was peacetime. Mm -hmm. So you were home on leave, mm -hmm. and how did you hear about the war? <laughs> uh, my brother Salvi, who was a Guadalcanal veteran, and <laughs> He says to me one day when I was home on leave, he says, you know, Jim, I, I guess you might be going to Korea. And I said, Where, where's that? He says, well, there's a war just broke out. I said, it did? And uh, that's how I found out about it. I didn't uh, pay much attention to the newspapers in those days. And sure. news and so that's So you ca came back and you did some advanced training at Camp Lejeune? Very, very. In fact, hardly any training there. Uh, we just formed uh, a division to move up, to get together when we were planning on going to California, to Camp Pendleton, and uh, I, that's where we were going to do our training. And did you go to Pendleton? Yes, we went by and train. By train. Yeah. And, and um, once you got to California, what do you remember most about that area? Uh, not, not too much because we were only there for two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. It was mostly for physical. Uh, there wasn't really much uh, on weapons and stuff. There wasn't much training. It was mostly physical conditioning. And were you with, I think you mentioned the 2nd Marine Division? That was the 2nd Marine Division, but once I got to Camp Pendleton, they transferred us to the 1st Marine Division. And did you have some friends from original basic training or boot camp that you went on with that you had befriended? They were friends that I had joined with at Nat at Boston. That, uh, that were went in all that, through. In that they company. weren't from Natick, but they were from... Exactly. They were from Marlboro and mm -hmm. one from Winchester. So and, you uh, all went together? We went together. Not, even out yeah. to Pendleton? Well, Camp Pendleton, yeah. And then once you were notified from Camp Pendleton, were you notified then that you were going to be going over to Korea? Yes. How did you take that? Did you all talk I, about you know, it? I, 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 I don't know. I was young, you know, and I, I, I really didn't mind it. When I heard it, it was kind of exciting, you know. <laughs> and uh, before you know it, we were uh, down to San Diego boarding a ship after two weeks in Camp Pendleton. And going out on a ship to get over to Asia, what was that like? Did you experience any kind of sickness or? No, I didn't. Uh, okay. We did a lot of training on the ship. What type of training? You know, actually, uh, weapons mostly, just how to operate them, and it was very difficult to do on a ship, but that was the only way we could do it, so. Did they tell you what you might be up against? Uh, no. And at this point, you went in in March. Was this summertime now summertime. when you were going over? Yeah. It had to be uh, either July or August, uh, around there. I don't remember exactly. How long were you at sea? I think it was nonstop, probably 10 days. Did you um, fraternize with 
any of the seamen, or were you just sort of all separate? No, no, no. We didn't threaten these with anything. You know, we just stayed with our own. Did we were you going find to it confining? We're, we're heading to Japan. Japan first. Yeah. Right. And once you ten days at sea, once you reached the shores of Japan, where do you remember? Yes, uh, Kobe, Japan. Kobe, known as a place with very it's, good beef. Is Kobe it really? Kobe beef. Yes. How do you know that? <laughs> yeah. Kobe. And what what was it like for you, someone who you think never was out of New England, suddenly going to a foreign country? It was exciting. Mm -hmm. It really was. It was something new for me, and you know. And from Kobe went to uh, we went to a small camp, and we did some training there. And how long were you at that camp? I'm not sure. I really mm -hmm. don't. And it wasn't then, long. It wasn't long. It, probably a month. Mm -hmm. Not even that. And then, f were you hearing anything about what was happening? Oh yeah, we knew we knew it was happening. Uh, I remember when we uh, got to this camp in Japan. They had these signs, and one of the old timers from World War II said. Uh, to, to me, is you know, we're going to get our feet wet. And I didn't know quite what he meant until somebody told me. It was one of these signs with, to put on the landing badges. That so you was going to be, It was going to be an amphibious landing. It was. That's what he meant, you know. And you had never practiced an amphibious no, landing? No, no. This was all new to me. Uh, How like old I said, were you at this point? I about I just turned 20. Just 20. Yeah. So it was all new to me, and uh, so it was exciting. And I was a little nervous too. Um, so once you knew you were doing that, did you get word ahead of time that it's going to happen tomorrow, guys? No, or no. You just had no idea? We had no idea. So tell us about what happened. Well, we, uh, after training in Japan for a couple of weeks, we went back to Kobe to board uh, what they call an LST. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of a ship that has a flat bottom, but it opens up in the front. and. Uh, we bought an LST. And How many were on it? Not many. It was a, a small, I really don't know. The, the, probably a company, maybe 200 or so, 300. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we left uh, Kobe, Japan, went back to Kobe, boarded the ship, and we went up the Yellow Sea, and we were hitting the end, I'll never forget this, uh, uh, a typhoon, the end of it. And, I, and of course, the flat bottom of an LST I can remember the swells, the water just coming right up. <laughs> Every, everybody was sick and everything else. So uh, it was, that was quite an experience I won't forget. Heavy rain. No, it wasn't rain. It was just the, just the typhoon the, was over. Because just the, the typhoon wind. was yeah. over. Okay, yeah. so very high seas. So, How long were you on the LST? Five. For? Five days. Five days. And did you eat on it and sleep on it? Oh God, yeah, yeah. What was we, that we, like? We slept under tanks, and there was no, you know, really room to sleep. You know, under vehicles and on vehicles, and and uh, we were, <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> I really didn't like that at all. But that and was life. Once you met land, what happened? Uh, well, we <laughs> when we hit land, the wall was an, we were landing. You know, it was official. I'll tell you what, from the beginning, we were going to land at, we landed at Incheon. You did? Yeah. And, uh, and to land there was a great, great strategic move by General MacArthur. There was a 30-foot tide, and you had to land when that tide was in, and that was in the afternoon. Usually amphibious landings are early in the morning, I understand from World War II what they tell me, but this landing was unusual. It was raining, and I forget the day. And we came out of the, and, uh, and I came out of the bombardments and the planes, and it was like a movie to me. You know, I just, I'm just, I, not even a year out of high school, and here I am, and you know, my head up, and I'm one of those old timers said to me, "Put your head down." Yeah. All right. <laughs> they had a helmet on. Oh yeah, and uh, so uh, it was very exciting and very scary too at the same time. And uh, finally, we landed uh, at Incheon there with the tide in. So uh, that's where we're headed. And, from there we went on, you know. By foot? Yeah, by foot. And wh wh where were you going, did you know? We're going to capture Seoul, which was the capital. Of, you know, it, was, it was about, tw I, th I think, I'm not sure, maybe 20 miles away. And uh, so it, 
I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> you know, at the time, we don't know where we're going. Just follow the guy in front of you, you know. So. Once you landed, were you being targeted? Very little. We didn't get well, some resistance, yes. But. And how much gear were you carrying? Uh, no, not what they do today. God, I see these people in Iraq with all that stuff. I don't know how they were able to walk. No, we just had a knapsack, you know, and enough for, and, and of course your weapons. But uh, that was it. And your canteens, water. That's and you're all. still with your friends from uh, the No, Boston we split area? up in different companies. Okay. We were all split up in, by the and time. What company we, were you with at this time? I was, I think I was the George Company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines Regiment, 1st Marine Division. 1st Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And were you trying to go X amount of miles per day? Yes. We, we had a, uh, which he was my, my favorite guy to this day. In fact, there's a book written about him. Uh, our regimental commander was uh, Colonel Chesty Poor. How do you spell his last name? Puller, P-U-L-L-E-R. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he became famous uh, to this day. And he was a type of you know, commander that uh, you just kept moving. I mean, this, <laughs> I was only there for seven days, but believe me, it was a day and night affair. I mean, uh, So you would was, move during the day. Were you on a road or? Off to the road. We were off these high, high hills. They weren't mountains, actually mountains, but they were very high hills. Like Coolidge Field Hill. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, was the weather uh, along with the rain? Was the, it warm? No, it stopped. The rain stopped. It was uh, it was chilly at night. It, w it was it was okay during the day. This is September now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, during the day, the uh, was was okay, but at nighttime it got very cold, and we didn't have the you know the equipment. And did you just sleep on the ground, or did yeah. you pitch tents? No. No tents. No time for tents. Mm -hmm. no. And what were you eating? Uh, sea rations, you know. And you said you were only there for seven days. So for, for seven days you were walking towards Seoul? Yes. And did you reach Seoul? I never got there. I just got wounded just outside of Seoul. Tell some, us. some small town, like Brookline is to Boston. Yeah. And I, I forgot the name of the town. I think it was Yongdong Po. It's just a suburb of Seoul, and that's where. Tell us about that day. Well, actually, uh, it was at night that I got wounded about 3 o'clock in the morning, and we were told to dig in. Uh, certainly, it was on a hill, and uh, we dug in. It was a lot of rock, if I remember. <laughs> you know, and at three o'clock in the morning, we we started getting shelled with mortars, and of course we're scrambling. And the commander said, "Move back." So we moved back about 20 yards, and uh, <laughs> it was a mistake because it was a direct a direct hit on our platoon. And of course, I lost a couple of friends at that that same that blast, and I was lucky enough, you know. I was a rookie, actually, and I was a, uh, about 10 yards away. I was an ammo carrier, and I was just, uh, so we lost a few people. They were very accurate with mortars, the North Koreans, very accurate. So, uh, Had and I, you and I been hit. on patrol then, or were you no, all No, we were dug in. We were dug in, yeah. And when you say dug in, literally foxhole. Fox fox hole. Hole. Fox How hole. many were in a foxhole? Just one, yeah. And I had to move out of it. That's when he told us to move back. I had to move out of my foxhole, so I moved back. And because uh, there was no foxhole at all, and then, you know, I was up against a, a little hill, you know. And you got hit. Yeah. Well, yeah. With everybody else, it was one of the direct hits, you know. So. How many do you think lost their lives? We lost two. Two. And yeah. were they nearby you yeah. at we the are. time? Yeah. And they were friends. Yeah. Well, not, see, I didn't know them. I wasn't there long enough, and we had a lot of reserves sure. that I hardly knew, and they just mixed us all together. And what happened to you, having moved back and you're sort of unprotected? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was an ammo carrier, and they would call if they wanted ammo, ammunition. I would, so I would have to go to the side, and I was at the side of a hill, and uh, there was a blast, and I just, phew, the shrapnel just came right by me, and it went hit me in the hand, and uh, so that was it. I'm a very lucky guy, Joan. When that happened, did you lose consciousness, or no, you no, were, and, no. and what was? What was the pain like? Was it uh, so stunning and surprised? Uh, I was shocked, you know, but I don't know, with so many things going on that you really didn't, you know, <laughs> I just hung in there with the rest of them. That's all. We all stuck together. 
And did medics come right away? Or? Uh, no, I had to move back. I was able to walk. Mm -hmm. I was uh, very fortunate. I was able to walk. And now, I, I hope you don't mind, but you mentioned to me that you lost part of your finger. Yeah. yeah. Had you lost it right then and there? or had uh, I lost half of it, and the other half I tucked. I could just take it out and put it underneath, and uh, the Corman combined just wrapped it, put something around it, so it was half off. It's good. And you mentioned shrapnel. Were you hit elsewhere with shrapnel? No. It was amazing. I had powder burns you know, on my sides, but it was amazing. Uh, I, I, it was the only place I got hit. And I was holding a rifle at the time, so uh, somebody up there likes me. And how far back did you have to move uh, before you all felt safe? Oh, I don't know. Well, we went about, about two, three hundred yards back to we regrouped. We had to regroup. And, and I was gone by that time. They took you. Yeah. And how did they take you out? I took oh, a jeep. A jeep. And yeah. did they take you to like a medevac, medic, medic? You ever watch MASH? Yes. So a MASH. That's there. what it was like. Exactly just exactly. Like that. And they were just as funny. So they got that right. The, doc huh? the doctor made a little remark about my hand. I can't repeat. You know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. they they had that sense of humor that you see on that. So once you were back there, what was happening? While you were, while you were being loaded onto the jeep, was there still? We were still hunkered down. Were we they firing move. back? Yeah, we we couldn't fire back. We didn't know where it was coming from. So. And it was. And, and our gunner, one of our gunners and assistants, were killed with the, with the direct hit. So we knew no gunners at all. But we got we survived the night or the morning. And then you're at the mash unit. Yeah. And what happened there? Uh, well, I met a guy from Natick. Really? <laughs> it was really strange. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, I don't know how he got a hold of my name. I was in one of the tents, and uh, they had operated on me, did the surgery, and this guy came up to me, and his name was Lawless. He says, Jimmy Arena. He goes, Yeah, who are you? And I knew him vaguely. He was a little older than me. He was my, by my brother's age. His name was Lawless, and he was a corpsman. So uh, it was a. Uh, I did meet somebody there that I knew. And how long were you in the unit, the mass unit? Uh, about a day or so, and they uh, evacuated me out to Incheon, uh, to the hospital ship. And that's when you, I noticed the 30-foot tide. Ships were actually in mud. Really weird. They were in mud. They get stuck. They're just right there. They had to wait for the tide to come the in before come they back could. In. So I was in a hospital ship there, and, they, and from there, uh, the hospital ship took us, uh, a lot of us, to uh, Japan. When this all happened, and you mentioned earlier about your mother and the stress that she went through with yeah. your brothers, yeah. did, how, how soon after you were wounded did they hear that you were wounded? Uh, I don't know. Uh, my brother John told me that they got a telegram, and the, the telegraph office was down where the depot was, now where the train station is. In Natick. And my brother wouldn't let the t cab driver take the telegram to my house. So my, my brother came up and... It's, it's one of the times in the Marine Corps that I really feel, in fact, I, it still bothers me to this day, uh, and I didn't find out, my mother, I, I, she got sick over it, put her in a hospital, and my family never told me that until mm -hmm. years afterwards. And you know, I kind of... It, it bothers me a lot. It sure. just still bothers me to this day. Because I know what she went through during World War II. And my five brothers, they come back without a scratch. Mm -hmm. And I go over there, and in seven days, I get whacked, and I'm embarrassed. I was embarrassed to talk to my brother Salvi and those John. And, uh, those guys, John and Tony, were in Europe during the war. Salvi and Frankie in the Pacific. My brother Joe was in the Pacific. We thought he was a prisoner of war. <laughs> and here I am, you know, in their short time. And I put all that stress on my mother. And uh, it kind of bothers me. It's and yet, sad. judging from what occurred, you were lucky to be alive. Oh, God. I think about it a lot. And your brother, one of your brothers, was kind enough, actually, to intercept yeah. the um, yeah. Well, the, the cab driver went to my brother first. I think my brother was in the police department. I'm not sure at the time. I don't know how he knew. But anyway, he it said... It was a he, small town, so I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And he said, do you want me to take this to your mother? And John said, no. You know, so... It so he of, had to tell her. Yeah. That had to be hard for him, too. Kind of sad. Kind of sad. So 
you you were on the hospital ship back to Japan, and then mm -hmm. how long did you stay in Japan? Uh, Joan, I really don't know, but I remember being, being at that camp also for uh, R and R. That they call R and R. The Army calls it R and R. I don't know what. That, and I stayed there for about a couple of weeks, and they they were examining all of us, ones that would come back home or ones that would go back. And I can remember lining up that day for the decision. And you know, at that time, you know, if I went back, I went back. It didn't. You know, I was young, but with my wound, I couldn't go back, so they sent me home. So. Uh, and did you go by ship again? Uh, how, yes, I came back home, home by ship. I bought a uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a ship that was contracted out, and uh, the food was terrible. How long were you at we sea stopped, then? We stopped at Okinawa to pick up a dog. To pick I, up a, a, a dog. A dog. Yeah. Why? Well, like I said, the ship was under contract. It was a private, oh, and yeah. uh, a woman and a dog. I can remember, this is in Okinawa. <laughs> I thought we'd never get home. But then we stopped at Pearl Harbor on the way home, and then uh, San Francisco. So did you see the effects of World War II at Pearl Harbor when you? No, no, I never got off the ship. Right. We just uh, got there. And then from San Francisco, did you have to get re-examined? No, no, San Francisco, I, I don't remember. We didn't get examined, but I don't recall. All I know is I got on a, my first plane ride down to San Diego. To, my brother lived, a Navy guy, uh, lived in San Diego. And I went from there on a, from a plane. It was a Navy plane down to San Diego. To visit with him? Visit with him. And uh, I was going to go home, and he said, no, no, you you look too, you look, now don't want to see you that way. Go put some weight on you first before you go home, you know. So how long did you stay with him? About a week. It was over Christmas and New Year's, I think, yeah. So being in San Diego, was the weather a little nicer? Oh, yeah, yeah. He took good care of me. Did you talk at all with your brother at that time about what occurred? You know, not really. I, not unless they asked me. Uh, even when I got home, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't talk about it unless... They asked me. My older brothers were in the war, so they asked me. You had but, something in common yeah, with them. Uh, but I never really uh, talked too much about it. My, right now, at the present time, my sons are older now. And one son here recently asked me, my son Joe, asked me some things about Korean. And you know, I can't remember. And then the next day, I'm thinking, jeez, the answer came to me, what he wanted to know. It took me a day to, to, remember. To, to remember. You know, it's been almost 60 years. Sure. So uh, that's the way it goes. When you were hit and wounded, what was your rank at that time? Private first class. When you were hit, and it was in the middle of the night, as you said, mm -hmm. so you got no air support then, or did you? Uh, oh, we have not at night, no. But that was very, very, very important the ear support we got, because I saw the damage it did. We moved on that day, yeah. after, and uh, the damage they did, and wow, saved a lot of lives. After the fact, they came yeah. in, and, yeah. and oh. what did they do, bomb different they areas? They strafed. See, it was like a main road, probably like Route 9 is, you know, sure. to Boston, and, uh, I don't, and it was a main, I don't even know if it was hot topped or not, I can't, but I can remember seeing the, what they did to the tanks, the enemy tanks, and I, mean, I still, the only sad part, I saw a lot of civilian, first time I ever saw uh, dead bodies, you know, civilian dead bodies. What's that um, like for a 20 year old to see that? It was that? really gross. I mean, I, I really, but I, at that age, I guess, well, this is the way it's supposed to be, you know. It would probably bother me more now, mm -hmm. where I have my own family, mm -hmm. than it probably did then, you know. But uh, I see a lot of civilians. Now, did you see other civilians who were alive? And, and if so, how not did many. they? Not many. Not many. How many. did they? How did they react to you when you were going through there? Uh, well, we went through one colony. Uh, what, what they call it? A leper colony? Yeah. And, uh, but they all just stood back behind. They didn't come out. You know, they just stood still and they hid behind the And you the doors. knew it was a leper colony? Well, I, that's what somebody told us. <laughs> okay. okay. We, we know for sure. Yeah. But we went through that colony and uh, they never came out. We never, I never saw it. Like I said, it was a very short time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really, you know, look around. Sure. <laughs> you know. So. Now, when you, when you, you had mentioned earlier Colonel Puller. Puller, Chesty Puller, yes. And do you feel he was a good leader? Very, very good. Very good. He was so good that I guess 
the enemy, we left the enemy behind us. <laughs> Do you feel your medical treatment over there when it occurred was adequate? I couldn't tell the difference. You know, I never was in combat before, so I, I assumed it was good. They got me out of there, and I thought it was good, yeah. Were there nurses in the mass unit also? I didn't see one. You just worked with doctors and... Yeah, and, and corpsmen. Corpsmen. Yeah. While you were there, were you getting updates on what was occurring? No. We did hear rumors when I was in Japan uh, that the Chinese were possibly going to enter the war, and, uh, but we didn't pay much attention to it at the time. And then they did, correct? They did, mm -hmm. yeah. And did you get your news through uh, radio or newspaper yeah. or word, word of, of mouth. mouth? Word of mouth, yeah. And having been there for such a short time, you didn't really have what you would call going away for a real R&R, &R, right? No. right? We were in Kyoto, uh, that camp. Like I said, uh, the name of it was Camp Atsu. And uh, we did have a couple of nights out in the city of Kyoto. This camp was right near Kyoto, the city of Kyoto. And how was that? How did the people in the... It was good. They were good. Japanese, but this is in J Japan. They were very good to us. And they could speak English? Some of them could, yeah. Did you eat any of the local food? No. <laughs> yeah. Before you entered combat, how much do you, did you remember or did you know about the enemy that you were going to face? Absolutely nothing. How about after? <laughs> Very little after. You know, I knew, you know, they were pretty good military fighters, but I, I didn't know them personally. I never met anybody personally. So I... Do you feel you were properly trained and equipped for what you were going to face? Uh, not, not as much as I would have loved to be more, but uh, I thought we could have got more training. But the time was a problem. Because the war yeah. broke out. Yeah. Do you feel your weapons were equal to, better than, or inferior to what you were facing? Uh, I think we were better. I think we were better. And of course, our Air, for Air Force. I don't think they had much of an Air Force. So we, uh, we did were good. Once you came back from San Diego, did you go to Boston? Did you, did you have to finish out your career? Oh, yeah. So once you got home, did you have some time off? Oh, yeah. How yeah. much time? Do you remember? I don't know. Uh, well, what was it? 30 days, I think, they gave us at that time. And then I got stationed at, uh, I went to Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Rhode Island? Yeah. While you were home, you mentioned earlier that your mom took it really hard. Mm -hmm. Was she home from the hospital when oh, you yeah. got oh, home? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And did she feel that you looked pretty good for what you had been through? Oh, yeah. She studied you. She takes, you know, yeah, she was a great lady. Yeah. So you had a large family. Yeah, right? 10. There was 10. And I was the youngest. So, so. so that had to be very tough for yeah. everybody yeah. to have the youngest go off to war. Yeah. So you had a 30-day leave. During that 30 days, what did you do? To oh, I had a lot of fun. Yeah. And saw all my friends, you know, and it was great. I think it was 30 days, Joan. I'm not sure. And most of your friends were not in the service? They were starting to go in the service they at the time. The war, then. you know, I so was over and back before. <laughs> before many of them even yeah, left. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you were one of the early ones That's going right. over. That's right. So then you went to Rhode Island, and how long were you stationed? Oh, uh, that was six months. It, it didn't last long enough. And what were you doing on a daily God basis there? Main, main gate and guarding. There was a pier there. Where the big ships came in and guard the, the pier. And it was a good, it was good duty. I was home every other week. I was going to ask that. You were so close yeah. to home that you yeah. could come home? But that, like they say in the military, good duty never lasts. So then what happened? <laughs> then I got transferred back to... Uh, Camp Lejeune. However, being one of the first ones back from Korea, uh, 
I had the opportunity. They asked me if I wanted to go to the Mediterranean. And I, with a certain battalion, I said, sure. So they transferred me to a battalion that goes to the Med. They, the Marine Corps always have, the Sixth Fleet always has a battalion in the Mediterranean at all times. So and they would be on a ship? Yeah, we live on a ship. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to go join that battalion. And then I says to my mother, I says, Mom, I'm going to go see your, see your sisters and your relatives. And she just shrugged it off because nobody had ever been there since they came to this country. And I wasn't sure I was going to go either, but I said it anyway. So when you went on this ship to the Mediterranean, um, you, did you have full use of your left hand at that point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was very sensitive. Sensitive, it still is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you went on, did you go right from this area to the Mediterranean? No, I went back to Camp Lejeune. Okay, that's what and, you said, and, sorry. Uh, I joined this battalion that was going and... Uh, Do you remember what battalion it was? No. Okay. I, I was in the 2nd Marine Division now, and uh, I really don't remember. And, and you went by sea? I went... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and what were you doing? Were you going up and down the coast or? Oh, no. No, no. We traveled uh, Naples, Italy, uh, France, Nice, France, uh, Toronto, Italy, uh, Athens, Greece, uh, Beirut, Syria. So, it must yeah. have been fascinating. It was for great. You. It was a great best studio you had. <laughs> and what were you doing? Just patrolling? Actually, we made a couple of amphibious landings, right, the one on Crete, the island of Crete, and one on the island of Sardinia. But uh, other than that, it was like a vacation, you know. We lived on the ship, and it was great. Probably got a met great Bobby Drew in Naples, Italy. You met Bobby Drew, yeah, he was on who a, happens he, to he be was a on an aircraft. Resident. Yeah, he, well, I knew he was on an aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. and the aircraft carrier was anchored out there in Naples Harbor, and I went out to see him out there, and we went out on the night. That had to be fun. Yeah, it was. Seeing yeah. someone you knew. Yeah. And how was the weather? Fine. Fine. I went to Sicily. I didn't tell you that. That's, that was the most important. Tell us about Sicily. We, uh, <laughs> we, we, hit, we stopped at three ports. Palermo, Syracuse, Syracuse, uh, just two, two ports. Syracuse and Palermo. And, uh, Palermo, I was allowed to go and see my relatives in Messina, which was about 70 miles away, I think. And how did you get there? Oh, God. That was, what an experience that was. Uh, uh, by train, by myself. And you had never met them before? No. Did they know you were coming? Well, you know, my mother had written them and said it was a possibility that I might come. And, you know, honest to God, uh, I think they must have had a watch, a guard out every day looking for me because the day I arrived, I went by train from Palermo to, to Messina, and that was an experience right there, the train ride. And I got in this taxi, and they took me up in this hill, the village outside of the city. And I pulled into this village where I could almost touch the buildings, and, and I heard somebody running down the, as I got out of the cab. It was my cousin, like she was waiting, you know what I mean? And I didn't tell them what day I was coming or anything. I can remember giving the cab driver heck for charging me $5 for that ride. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a lot of money but, back then. Yeah, but uh, that, was, that was the most uh, highlight of my probably military career, that trip to see my aunts. And, you know, it was really great. Now, could you speak Italian? A little bit, And yeah. could they speak English? No, no. Well, there they was somebody in the neighborhood that could speak, <laughs> speak English. It was funny, now that you mentioned that, uh, my cousins, my, my, yeah, my cousins, come on, I want to take you someplace. So I was right in the village. OK, where the hell is this guy taking me? So he took me to this place. And who was in there but Mr. Costa from Natick. He worked at the Wallen Hill School for years. And he had moved back. To Italy. I, I had no idea he was there. <laughs> oh, it was unbelievable. What are you doing here? He says he spoke English, you know. So Did Mr. you see yeah. any familiarity between? Faces. Yeah, my, uh, you could tell they were related. Yeah, my 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 aunt looked like my mother. My two aunts. I had my aunt was a sister superior, and she ran an orphanage in Messina, Sicily, and and uh, they looked like my mother. 
What was your mother's na maiden name? Uh, La Scala. La Scala. Yeah. It was a... Uh, How long were you there for? I think about three days, two days. And they, they t I, of course, I had the uniform. I took the uniform off, and they gave me this suit that was about too big for me. You know, I, just, I didn't want to go around in the neighborhood with that uniform on, but, sure. but the suit was so big. And, but anyway, uh, it was very enjoyable. Was I, it a I feast? enjoyed that. Yeah. A, gal a party? One they party. had a big party for me the day I left. Yeah, I got some pictures home, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was good. Your mom must have been thrilled. Oh, they say my sister was telling me my mother cried like a baby. Yeah, yeah. That's so great. What a well, great she never, story. She never, wanted, she never got back there, my mother. And she could have one time, I guess. Cause my father and brother went on. Years later, they went back, my brother and uh, my father. Now, where had your parents met? I guess, <laughs> I guess over there. Uh, it was a small little village, you know, outside of the city. So. But uh, that was exciting. I, uh, I have good memories of that. And what was the village name again? The village name was Master San Juan. And I remember my aunt looking at me when I first walked in the door, and she said in Italian, which I understood what she said, she says, she looks just like his father. <laughs> I knew what she said. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was great. That's wonderful. Yeah. And my mother thought I'd never make it. She, she never thought I would go back there to see her aunt sisters, you know. So it, it, may, it certainly must have relieved her, too, that your Mediterranean yes. duty was so much less safer. Mm -hmm. It was safer. Mm -hmm. uh, and they took me down to meet my aunt, the nun, uh, at this orphanage, right down in the city. And uh, it was really moving because uh, they put me in this altar, this little chapel, and all these girls came in that, you know, and uh, they all said some prayers for me. <laughs> I needed them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I remember those things. That's a wonderful story. Yeah. Did you keep in touch with them after? Not as much, not as much, but uh, we are, my, my son Jim went over there, and he keeps in contact, and Denise, with them, you know. That's terrific. The younger crowd, yeah. yeah. Most of them now are, are passed away, my cousins. Yeah. I think I have a couple that are still left, but most of them are gone. So after Sicily, Italy, Mediterranean, how long were you in the Mediterranean? Uh, oh, five months, five, six months, came back. And then what? Uh, then we came back to uh, Camp Lejeune, and I was in the Second Marine Division at that time again. And then I made some two trips on for exercises in the Caribbean. And at this point, was the Korean conflict winding uh, down, or let's see, the con yeah, the war was over in '53. I was still in. Uh, yeah, I think the conflict still was going on. So were you coming in and out of Camp Lejeune at that point in time? No, I was or? there now for, I was at Camp Lejeune probably from the time I got discharged. But I made two trips to uh, the, the Caribbean on military exercises, you know, maneuvers they called. Did you have any kind of specialty at that time when you were on maneuvers? No, I was the same uh, on a mortar, mortar platoon. During that time, did you ever talk about your experience in, in Korea with any of your platoon mates? Not really. I don't, no. I don't see them. I, I, I don't see them anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, while you were doing um, the maneuvers, uh, uh, just in chatting. We got all, got all split up. Yeah. We weren't together anymore. Yeah. You know, Some got discharged. I saw people come in. They were drafted. They came in after me, and they were discharged before, before me, finished. yeah. So, so it was kind of frustrating. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Was that because you enlisted and you had the extra yeah. year? Well, I or? went in in peacetime, mm -hmm. and so. So when were you discharged? Uh, Camp Lejeune, yeah. What year, do you remember? 1954. At what rank? Sergeant. And because you were wounded and you saw combat, what mm. kind of medals did you get? Um, well, no big deal. Uh, Purple Heart and a uh, Good Conduct Medal, uh, which everybody got. And, well, I guess if you're a Good Conduct. But, Mostly uh, The everybody. Presidential Unit Citation. Uh, I don't know. 
So once you were done, what was it like coming home? It was great. Why? I don't know. I was married. Oh, so when did I you got get married, married in the service? I got married in 1952, and uh, and it was great to get home. So, so. in '52, you got married mm -hmm. while you were still at Camp Lejeune. Uh, yes. And your wife, did she come with you? No. Or she stayed home in Natick. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. She was did. she working at the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. She she uh, continued working, and it worked out okay. And while while married but separated like that, how often did you get home or to see uh, each other? Not often. We used to drive home. Can you imagine, John, drive home 826 miles from Camp Lejeune, and there was no 95 at the time, and stay one day and then go back. Another, you know, I don't know how I did it, yeah. but it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. How long have you been married? Uh, I think it's 56 years. Bless you. Yeah. When you came home, did you discuss with, I think you said earlier you mm. really didn't, but repeating that again, did you discuss with your family, friends, anything about what transpired, especially during combat and no, injury? No, not really, no. no. Not unless my older brothers asked me something. No, not really. Did you join any unit of the military reserve? No, no. Did you join any veterans organizations? You name it. I, <laughs> you name it. it. I think I belong to everyone in Italy except the AMVETS, and uh, nobody asked me. <laughs> and are you still active in yeah. those organizations? I'm not active. I am a life member of a couple of them. Have you received any veterans benefits, such as hospitalization benefits? Yeah, well, I've, I've been to the VA a couple of times for eyes and ears, you know, and stuff like that. And do you get any kind of disability because of your injury? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about any GI Bill or anything like that? No, I never use it. Do you attend any reunions from your old outfit? No. Once you came home, what did you do for work? Uh, you came home to a wife? I came home, yeah, and I, I don't know, I got a call one night from uh, my brother, he was at the police station at the time. He says, "You know, there's going to Johnny White was in. He says that uh, there's going to be a there's going to be a post office exam. Why don't you why don't you take it?" And I said, "Yeah, why not?" So I took it, and I, I so I went into the post office. And I stayed there for almost forty years, and uh, it was a good move on my part. I enjoyed it. And many people in the town of Nate. And I know, know where they all live, too. You, yes. <laughs> the numbers of their houses, too. <laughs> I, I will say at this point that in talking to our videographer, Dan, you knew exactly not only that he lived in South Natick, but what his street number was, which is right. remarkable after all these years. <laughs> I know. People say, uh, people come up to me a lot in that. Uh, Hi, Jim, how are you? And uh, I, I don't know their names, but well, once they tell me their names, I said, Oh, I, and then I remember the, the number of the You know the, the street house. and the number. <laughs> yeah. And you retired. I wish I had that memory when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> you did retire from the post office? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've been retired quite a while now. How important to you was serving in the military? I don't know. I think I grew up a lot. And, uh, and I look around and I see how lucky I am. You know, I, I play in a band now and I go to these cemeteries a lot during the holidays. I play in a band in Canton. And, uh, and when I go to the local cemetery up here in Natick and I look around and I see people that I've known, I grew up with, and I say, wow, what a lucky guy I am. You know, you're still... I'm here, uh, my family's all healthy, and uh, I really appreciate that. And I think the military has a lot to do with that, too. Uh, so you feel it affected your life and... and I don't know if it affected my life, but it didn't hurt it, sort of that way. Looking back, was there any memorable experience or character or even a humorous situation that kind of stands out in your mind? Well, the character was probably Chesty Puller, and uh, getting married probably was a highlight, too, of my military career. Did you get married in Natick? Yes, St. Patrick's, yeah. Well, I married a local girl. I married a neighborhood girl, actually. And what is your wife's maiden name? McGrath. Yeah. Did you go together in high school? 
Yes. Not steady, but off and on. Above all, is there one thought or incident or anything else that you would like to share with your family or others who will be viewing this tape? I don't know. I think I've covered it, though. <laughs> uh, I really can't think of anything right now, but... Uh, I know you wanted to... Not that you were pressured to do this interview, but you did want to do it for your family and grandchildren. Your grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. Anything else additionally you'd like to say as we finish this? Well, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's been a while. I, I know Stan Korn's been after me for a number of years uh, to do this, but I just never, uh, you know, I don't. So I saw you that day at the, at the mall, and I said, well, now's the time. Well, we appreciate James <laughs> yeah. V. Arena. Well, thank you so much thank for you. coming thank in you. today.